Today I'd like to welcome Nick Ballering. He's from the University of Virginia and our candidate today for the Astro Material and Solar System Formation faculty position. Currently, he's an Origin Fellow, fellow at UVA at the Virginia Initiative for on Cosmic Origins in the Department of Astronomy. In 2016 to 2019, he was a postdoctoral associate at Stewart Observatory, at the University of Arizona. Prior to that, he got his PhD in astronomy from the University of Arizona with a dissertation measuring the structure and composition of circumstellar dust debris. And he graduated in 2008 with a bachelor in science um, in astronomy, physics, mathematics, applied math, engineering, and physics from the University of Wisconsin. So I hear he's a recovering cheese head. Um, Nick has a very broad perspective in his research, as I think you'll see today. And he has made uh, multiple impact, um, impacts in multiple fields covering anywhere from protoplanetary to white dwarf evolutionary disk stages. Um, his research interests revolve around exoplanetary system by observing and modeling the structure and composition of ice and dust and circumstellar disks. And in investigating uh, ice reservoir disks, it's getting us closer to understanding uh, habitable planet formation. In his research, he uses multiple telescopes from ground base ALMA to SOFIA, um, HST, as well as James Webb Space Telescope. So with that, I give you Nick Ballering and his talk today, which is New Views into Planet Forming, Dust, and Ice. Take it away, Nick. All right. Thank you so much for that great introduction. And thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in today. So I'd like to motivate uh, this talk by introducing some of the big questions in this field of astronomy. These are, you know, how common are Earth-like planets in the galaxy? Do they reside in systems similar to our own solar systems? And do they have the materials necessary for life? So in the last few decades, there's been an enormous amount of success um, detecting exoplanets around other stars with the radio velocity surveys and the uh, transit techniques from the Kepler and TESS missions. These uh, methods have measured the mass, the size and the orbits of a number of exoplanets, including the atmospheric composition of some as well. And um, this has filled in a nice demographics uh, of our understanding of exoplanets, especially in the inner regions of these systems where these observational techniques are most sensitive. But uh, exoplanet demographics don't give the whole story in terms of uh, habitability. For instance, these exoplanet detection techniques cannot tell us the full volatile inventory of these planets, the schnapps molecules that are most important for life, at least here on Earth. And they don't give us the full refractory budget either. So some things we might still want to know are, you know, how much water does a typical terrestrial planet have? Does it have the right amount of water like Earth or does it have too much or too little? Do most terrestrial potentially habitable planets have outer planets, uh, outer giant planets like we have Jupiter in our solar system, which played a large role on the, on the evolution of our solar system? Do exoplanets typically have liquid cores and protective magnetic fields? And do they have the right mineralogy to sustain plate tectonics, which plays an important role in regulating planetary climate and habitability. So my argument is that a more complete picture of planetary habitability requires studying the planet forming dust and ices in circumstellar disks. And um, these include protoplanetary disks, which are around young stars and are the sites of ongoing planet formation. Uh, also debris disks around mature adult stars. These are um, residual belts of planetesimals similar to the asteroid and Kuiper belts in our solar system. And when these planetesimals collide, they re release dust, which is observable. So in this case, we're probing the, the leftover material from planet formation. And finally, we can also look at white dwarf disks. So white dwarfs are the exhausted core of stars. And we've seen that they too have disks of dust around them, which we think arise when 
uh, planetesimal, again, left over in that system, gets too close to the white dwarf, it can be uh, destroyed by tidal forces releasing its dust. So I'm gonna go through um, some recent work on all three of these types of disks today. And um, I'm glad that my enthusiasm for this area of research, um, that I'm not alone in that enthusiasm. So if you're not familiar, the uh, astronomy community all gets together about every 10 years or so and writes one of these decadal reports to identify the major um, missions and areas of science that are priority for the next decade. So the most recent survey um, from 2020 uh, identified worlds and stars in context as, as one of the key, uh, one of three key science challenges for the next decade. And within that, they identified pathways to habitable worlds as the priority area. They go, then went on to say that properly interpreting exoplanet observations will also require a scientific context, understanding the formation and history of these planetary systems to see how life enabling chemicals flow onto these worlds. And I think that the, uh, the major progress in understanding uh, uh, dust and ice and disks is gonna come from uh, array of powerful observing facilities. So we already have an, a great library of infrared spectra from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is still very valuable, even though Spitzer itself is retired. Um, current workhorses like the Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based ALMA in a submillimeter and millimeter uh, are gonna be continuing to pull their weight uh, for the coming years to come. Um, SOFIA has been flying for several years now. Uh, but there's new far infrared instrumentation being developed that will also unlock uh, dust and ice features. James Webb will be a play a huge role in this field. It was launched on Christmas last year, and we're hoping to see some data from it soon. Uh, looking a little further ahead, SphereX is another infrared mission which will survey the entire sky from one to five microns. Uh, both the Roman Space Telescope and large ground based telescopes will offer really high resolution, high contrast imaging in the optical and near infrared. And looking a little further to the future, uh, the NGVLA, the successor to the very large array, will um, really take the next step in uh, this sort of science in the radio. And the decadal report also recommended the development of a far IR NASA probe mission, which will again make great progress in the far IR regime. But these observations alone are not sufficient to, to understand dust and ice. We also need to couple them with modeling efforts. And some of the modeling efforts that I'm most involved in, and I'll tell you about today, are running disk, uh, simulations of disk chemistry, also working with dust and ice optical properties and running radiative transfer simulations to generate uh, observables. And uh, we also can take advantage of uh, connections with the cosmochemistry and astromaterials community. We can do this to uh, properly interpret what we're seeing around other stars in relationship to materials in our solar system. And we can um, collaborate with the geophysics and planetary and earth sciences communities to understand how variations in planet composition can translate into variations in their planetary processes and have so let's get started on the topic of uh, protoplanetary um, dust, uh, protoplanetary disk dust. And the big player in this field is ALMA. So the reason ALMA is so powerful is that it has uh, very high sensitivity and very high spatial resolution at submillimeter and millimeter wavelengths. And this wavelength is ideal for measuring um, the dust in disks because uh, at shorter wavelengths, disks tend to be optically thick, and so you can really only trace the surface of the disks. But at longer wavelengths, disks are more optically thin. We can take a accounting of the full amount of dust in them. Longer wavelengths also trace the large dust grains, which dominate their mass budget and reside closer to the disk midplane, where planet formation is thought to take place. Uh, so you can see on the right here one of a, one of the spectacular results that has come out of. Um, all the surveys of protoplanetary disks. This is from the D-Sharp project, and they surveyed a number of disks in nearby uh, star forming regions. And they uncovered uh, a number of rings and gaps and spiral features in these disks, which are um, suggestive that there are unseen planets already in these systems. But as spectacular as the re these results are, I don't think that they're 
necessarily representative of the typical sites for plant information. And for that reason, I've turned my attention more to the Orion Nebula cluster, uh, which is probably more representative of a typical star and planet formation. It's a rich cluster uh, environment with a number of more massive stars and a higher stellar density than in the low mass star forming regions. And so I worked um, on a couple of ALMA projects in this region, an ALMA Band 7 survey that was published in 2018. And I'm currently working on an ALMA Band 3 survey at slightly longer wavelengths, um, which is in prep. The main results of our work so far on um, um, disks in the Orion Nebula cluster is that they're small. So you can see here a cumulative distribution of disk sizes for the ONC in red versus other lower mass star forming regions. You can see a very clear lack of large disks in the ONC. And we think this is due to photo evaporation by uh, UV radiation from uh, the trapezium OB stars in the cluster. So to give a sense of the, of the scale of these disks, um, here's some few representative sources from my band three survey. Um, and then here I've plotted one of those same disks from the D-sharp project at the same linear scale. And you can see how much more compact these ONC sources seem to be. Now this, this photo, vapor, photo evaporation process is, um, that's probably driving these small sizes can also be probed directly, um, which we see in the proplets which we also pick up in the ALMA survey. So, and what's going on in these type of sources is that you see the dust disk here surrounded by this cocoon of free-free uh, emission from ionized gas. And this is because uh, the UV radiation is heating the, some of the gas in the disk. Um, the disk is flowing out of the, uh, the gas is flowing out of the disk and being ionized forming this cocoon, sort of as shown in this uh, cartoon. So if we take a look at one of these proplids at multi, uh, at multi different, at a few different bands, we can see that in band three here uh, at three millimeters, we're picking up, as I showed, both the free free emission and the dust emission from the disk. We go to shorter wavelengths, like at ALMA band seven, we only pick up the dust emission. And if we go to longer wavelengths, like with VLA data, we're only picking up the free free. And this can be understood by looking at the spectral dependence of these two different types of emission. Dust emission has a steeper slope with wavelengths where free free emission is relatively flat. Um, what we're really interested in though is the dust properties of the disk. And to get a better handle on that, we want to go to longer wavelengths because measuring the slope, especially the long wavelengths, gives us the best information we can have about the grain properties in these disks. So that will be a great opportunity for um, an upcoming new band on OMA, OMA Band 1, which should be available next year, as well as a little later in the decade, the uh, NGVLA, which will sample out to even longer wavelengths. And the nice thing about uh, having that high uh, spatial resolution from these radio interferometers is that we can spatially separate the dust and the free free. If we tried to, for these proplids, use these longer bands without such high spatial resolution, the free free flux and the dust flux would be mixed together and we'd have a hard time detecting the dust and measuring it because the free free would be dominant just as we see here in VLA. Um, so transitioning away from dust, we also wanna focus on ice and disks. And ices are really important because they play a critical role in grain growth and planetesimal formation. Um, they also sequester the, some of those very important biocritical volatiles and deliver them to potentially habitable terrestrial planets. Um, so to observe ices, we want to not look in the radio or the submillimeter, but focus our attention on the infrared. And here we see um, absorption and scattering spectral features in the near and mid infrared for various ice species, as well as emission features in the far infrared. So um, looking at earlier stages of star formation, we've detected many um, different ices. So in molecular clouds and protostellar envelopes, here is an example of uh, three spectra from, free, from three massive protostars. You can see in their infrared um, spectrum, a, a num, uh, uh, numerous ice species detected in their absorption spectrum, detected via absorption spectroscopy. Um, like I said, the, the disk ice measurements have been much more limited, but we're really excited about the opportunity from JWST, SphereX, SOFIA, and the FAR IR probe mission that I mentioned which will offer um, a revolutionized view of disguises.
So to understand exactly how um, disk, how ices are observed in protoplanetary, we need to understand a little bit about the disk geometry because this um, offers really four different methods to take advantage of when measuring disk ices. So if we take a spectrum of a disk in the far IR, again, we can see those far IR emission features um, from water ice. Um, if we look at a disk edge on, then we can look for some of those absorption features in the mid infrared. So what happens here is that the infrared um, continuum is emitted by the star and the warm inner disk. It scatters off of dust screens higher up in the disk and then passes outwards through the cold outer parts of the disk where it's imprinted with those ice features. We can also measure uh, infrared absorption features from ices if we happen to have a background star behind the disk. And this is more analogous to how ice observations are done in molecular clouds, but it's hard to do for, for disks because they're so small in the sky and it's unlikely to find a background star behind. We can also look at um, scatter light features for ice. In this case, if, if um, infrared radiation is scattered off of icy grains, we can see the, the feature in the scattered light as a, as a dip in their albedo. So because of this complicated geometry and because disks are physically and chemically heterogeneous, we need models to really properly interpret what we're gonna see from these types of observations. So this is a, a project I completed recently where I used essentially two, two steps from the methodology. First, um, ran a chemical evolution model to compute the abundance distribution of hundreds of species, including gas and ice. And then I, I extracted from that the, um, the ice distribution of six species, water, CO, CO2, methanol, methane, and ammonia. And I imported this into a radiative transfer model to simulate the, obser the observable ice features. So as you can imagine, there's a number of steps uh, in between these two major aspects of the model. And I'll just highlight one of those intermediary steps here. So one thing we had to do is that um, in the radiative transfer, we have a number of cells to set up the model. And the chemical model gives us a unique ice mixture at every single location in the disk. So a unique um, volume fraction of CO, CO2, CH3OH, NH3, uh, methane, and dust. Okay, so ideally we would just put that exact mixture as predicted by the chemical model into each cell in the radio transfer and run it. But for practical reasons, this was pretty much impossible with how the radio transfer model can be set up. So we reduced the problem by grouping um, grouping the cells of the radio transfer model into different zones of similar um, ice composition. So we did this by essentially looking in a seven dimensional parameter space where we looked at the volume fraction of these six ice species and dust. And then we found clusters of points in the chemical model with similar ratios of these six species. And we did this using a k-means cluster finding algorithm. So then we were able to take the median um, volume fraction of each, spite, of each species for all of the points in that zone and assign it to every point in that zone. And that made the rate of transfer much more tractable. So here you can see the different zones. We had 25 zones and how they're color coded in the seven dimensional parameter space. Now, if we switch back to physical space, you can see the vertical axis of a disc and the radial axis of a disc. And each of these points is a, is a cell in the simulation. And you can see to which zone it was assigned. So zone one, as you can see by these blue pluses, is the inner and upper part of the disk. And that's where the chemical model predicted pure dust with no ice because it's too warm. Um, in contrast down here, you can see these green squares, which is zone nine. And that's where we had the highest um, volume fraction of CO because it's the part of the disk um, where CO can, can survive. So that's sort of how that worked. Um, and now I'm gonna go through uh, each of those four methods on how to actually observe ices and disks and talk a little bit about what's been done previously, what can be done in the future, and what this modeling methodology that is described predicts. So starting with the far IR emission features, um, these arise from the lattice mode vibrations of water ice. And really there's only been a few detections so far using data from the ISO mission, as well as from the Herschel Space Telescope. So you can see here um, one detection in a very bright disk of the water ice emission features are around 43 microns. Uh, here's another detection with Herschel from a different disk. Um, and going forward, this is gonna be really where new instrumentation in the FAR AR um, will benefit us. So there's new instrumentation, instrumentation planned for SOFIA, 
as well as I mentioned before, the possible development of a FAR IR NASA probe mission. I examined the, these features for my model and I found that they were generally detectable. Um, and I looked for whether they happened to be arising from more from one um, zone of the disk than the other. So I took radial apertures of the disk and I found that, you know, um, the, the dust, the, the ice features do seem to be coming from a large radial range from about 25 AU all the way out to about uh, 80, uh, 80 AU in this fiducial model. Beyond that, the features tend to get more diluted. Uh, so moving on to this um, method of using the edge on disk absorption shown here in green, what are, the, what are the models predicting what's been done so far? So here's probably one of the best cases. This is from the Akari satellite of a disk that was that sees the water ice feature at three microns and the CO2 feature uh, as well in the spectrum. This happens to be one of the brighter edge on disks. Most disks are much too faint to get this quality of data with existing instrumentation. So the important thing to realize about this method is that the most of the flux that escapes the disk does so above and below this high optical depth midplane. And that's confirmed if you take an image of one of these edge on disks, um, for instance, in the visible, you can see a bright region above and below the disk where this light is scattered and escapes, or in a dark region along the midplane. So if we turn to our models and we look at, okay, what do we see in the infrared as a function of disk inclination? You can see that at a 75 degree uh, inclined disk, we can pick up the water ice feature fairly well, and maybe a hint of a methanol feature. As we go to um, looking at a disk more directly edge on, you can see the overall infrared continuum gets much fainter, but some of the features get more pronounced. So you can see as we get um, to more edge on, we're picking up CO2 features more prominently. In these disk integrated spectrum, we do not see CO features um, or um, methane or ammonia. And part of the reason for that is that it just depends um, how abundant the ices are and more importantly, where they are in the disk. So if you look here at the um, vertical and radial distribution of water ice, you can see that it's quite abundant throughout much of the disk. And that makes it very easy to detect. Um, if you, then the same is true for methanol. It's quite abundant throughout the disk and therefore it's easy to detect. CO2 um, is also quite abundant, but it doesn't go up to quite the same heights in the disk because it's um, slightly more volatile. Therefore, it doesn't, you don't pick up its features until you start looking at the disk more edge on. And CO is so volatile that it's confined really deep in the disk to the midplane, to this region that's almost entirely optically thick and very hard to probe. So um, I mentioned that uh, previous facilities have not quite been sensitive enough to this to pick up much of these features in edge on disk, JWST is gonna be great. Um, Sphere X, as I mentioned, will also sample a larger number of disks because it will probe the full sky, but it won't be quite as sensitive. So speaking of JWST, I wanted to see exactly what JWST could do. So I took that faintest spectrum, the 90 degree spectrum, and I ran it through the, um, the exposure time calculator for a, a very um, reasonable integration time for James Webb. And you can see here, the input data is in black. The simulated data is in gray, these gray points, which trace very well with the input model. And then if I smooth those points, because the, um, the spectral resolution is actually higher than we need, we get this green curve. You can see the green curve matches pretty much directly on top of the black curve. So James Webb will have, I predict, the, uh, uh, enough sensitivity to really make a lot of progress on disk ice measurements. And um, not only can it detect this, but it will actually detect this. There's already in cycle one, I looked through the accepted proposals, 13 edge on disks that are going to be observed with either near spec and or MIRI um, IFU spectrographs in cycle one. So we're very much looking forward to these data coming in. Um, what I showed before was disk integrated. So if you, you summed up all the flux across the disk, what would you see? But for some of the disks, they're big enough on the sky that we'll also be able to spatially resolve the signatures of ices. So here I take my, my model and I look at it edge on and in the, um, in the background grayscale image here, you can see what it would look like at one micron the image. You can see it's that bilobe structure that we see in real images where the, the flux is escaping above and below the midplane. And then I took apertures at various um, heights in the disk. So if you, if you were able to take an aperture higher up in the disk, you can again see the water ice feature a bit of CO and maybe a hint of methanol. But if you extract slightly deeper in the disk, the water ice feature gets much more prominent as well as 
the, the CO2 feature and the methanol feature, and you're picking up this longer wavelength CO2 feature as well. Um, if we were able to put an aperture right on the midplane of the disk, the overall flux here is very faint. You can see it's a couple of orders of magnitude faint. But if we were able to detect that, you could also pick up this CO feature by extracting just from the region where it is. Um, and in practice, JWST will be able to do something like that. It has this IFU capability, which if you're not familiar what an IFU is, it takes an image and it chops it up into what little spaxels, they're called spatial pixels. And then it gives you a spectrum from each one of these. So this type of observation is actually what we're gonna be getting from James Webb. Um, and the, the width of these apertures I set so that for a disk uh, located at 100 parsecs away, that this width of the aperture is corresponding to the spaxel size of the near spec instrument on JWST. Okay, so um, now let's talk about scattered light. So this is the, the case corresponding to these yellow lines. This has been done uh, for three disks so far by my count and only detecting the water ice feature. So here you need some sort of high contrast imaging system like coronography to isolate the scattered light of the surface of the disk from the bright central star. And then you observe that disk in multiple bands. So a, a band shortwards and longwards of the water ice feature at three microns and then right on the feature. And seeing this dip confirms that there's water ice near the surface of this disk. So with models, we're not limited so much to these um, observing techniques, we can look at the full spectral um, range, what we'd see from a, from a face on disk. And here is the region where you get a lot of scattered light. And you can see that um, if you were able to detect a full spectral resolution of scattered light, you should be also to pick out the CO2 feature um, getting stronger towards the outer part of the disk and perhaps even the CO feature from the very outer parts of the disk. Um, the, um, these, these gray lines here show models that I ran with, with scattering turned off in the radio transfer. And that just confirms that it's this part of the disk that we're seeing in scattered light. And where they converge, this part of the disk is um, being detected in thermal emission. And that's significant because you can see like, for instance, this CO2 feature is seen in thermal emission and this CO2 feature is seen in scattered light. So different features, even of the same molecule can have different radiative transfer properties. It might be probing different reservoirs of CO2 in the disk. Um, I'm also gonna highlight one program that we're gonna be doing with scattered light, um, as well as this background star in absorption technique. This is a program that I'm working on directly. It's gonna be near cam um, coronographic images of a disk, um, again, using the using photometry in and out of that three micron water ice feature. And so we're targeting the disk V4046 Sagittarii, which is fairly large and nearby. And because it's big on the sky, um, there's actually a number of background stars that have been identified behind the disk. If we overlay this, um, this region of the sky with what the disk looks like in Alma, where we can trace the extent of its CO, we, and, then, and then we circle all the background stars, you can see that many of them do lie right behind the disk. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see at the location of these background stars, um, we'll be able to probe the ice column through the full vertical extent of the disk by looking at the depth of the feature at three microns. At other locations, we're picking up the scattered light and picking up the, the albedo effect from disk near the ice surface. And so we'll be able to, in some ways, map out the azimuthal, radial, and to some extent, vertical distribution of ice in this disk. Okay, so I'm going to transition now away from protoplanetary disks and to debris disks. And again, these are belts of planetesimals left over from planet formation around mature stars. And here's a, a schematic of the sort of different dust populations that we see in these disks. So um, in green here is maybe an, an exo Kuiper belt, these cold belts that uh, are in the outer parts of these systems. Um, there's also uh, um, asteroid belt analogs, which you can see here um, peak at around 20 microns or so if you pick up their uh, thermal emission. There's exozodiacal dust in the inner parts of these systems, which are small grains sort of enmeshed in the terrestrial planet region, just like they are in the, um, the zodiacal light is in our solar system. And these tend to peak, the emission from this tends to peak around 10 microns. There's also in some systems, a halo of small grains that sort of overlaps with the Kuiper belt and extends out to much, much larger radii. 
And these tend to be small grains probably generated in this Kuiper belt and then pushed out of the system onto larger orbits by radiation pressure. So one of the projects I did was to look at hundreds of infrared spectra and measure their temperature. And so um, that supported this sort of multi-belt population where we see a population of warmer belts and a population of colder belts. And so we're seeing this sort of two belt population that seems to be somewhat analogous to what we have in our solar system. So unlike protoplanetary disks, debris disks are actually optically thin at all wavelengths. So instead of optical or near infrared light just tracing the surface of a disk where the, the millimeter light traced down into the midplane, we can see the same dust population with all wavelengths. And because of that, we can measure the color and albedo of the dust using panchromatic imaging and thus constrain the dust properties with multi-wavelength analysis. So many, many of, the, uh, of the studies of Doritas had focused a lot on disk geometry because they can reveal where there are planets that we can't see directly. But much of my focus has been also on the dust composition. So here's an example of one uh, very famous disk around Fomalhaut. You can see the ring here in scattered light with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here's how it looks like in the far AR with um, Herschel at 70 microns, and then with Alma um, in the... Um, in the millimeter. So all of these observations, these images are tracing the same dust population. I did a detailed analysis of a different disk, another one of the famous bright debris disks called Beta Pictoris. And this disk is edge-on. And again, as with Fomalhaut, it's been observed at multiple wavelengths. So we see the scattered light from this dust um, with the Hubble Space Telescope. We also see the, the mid-infrared signature and far-infrared signature from Spitzer and Herschel, and the millimeter signature from Alma. So the goal of my analysis was to see if we could match the brightness at all five different wavelengths where it was observed and um, seeing if there was, we could make some conclusions about the grain properties. So I found that if I uh, modeled the disk with bare silicates, it resulted in an, uh, an albedo that was way too high. So it overpredicted the, the scattered light brightness seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a, a common problem that was identified in a number of debris disks, but wasn't really solved. Um, so I found that um, by mixing in water ice or increasing the grain porosity in the modeling did not improve the fit, but I could match all of the data sets, as you can see here, by mixing in 40% um, of refractory organic compounds in with 60% of silicates. And so um, these refractory organics are maybe analogous to something we see in the solar system, like for um, processed ices that we see uh, maybe darken and redden some of the solar system bodies. So exactly what these refractory organics are is something I'm, I've been really interested in talking with the solar system community and astro-materials community to better understand. Just to drive this, um, the, the power of this method home, there's another case, the disk HR 4796, where a similar analysis was done. And this disk is it's not quite edge on, it's not quite face on, it's somewhat inclined, so it looks like this on the sky. Uh, in this study, um, the authors point out, again, they have um, scattered light images in the visible and near infrared, and they have thermal emission measurements at longer wavelengths, and they show, okay, we can match the scattered light with a number of different models, but if we translate them to the thermal infrared, they miss wildly. Conversely, if they find the best fit model to the thermal infrared, um, it totally misses the scattered light. So you do have to try to, if you're trying to match um, and predict the, the dust composition, you wanna match both of these types of data sets simultaneously. And they were able to do that relatively successful for this disk as well. And their conclusions were somewhat similar to my own. They found that water ice was very unlikely. Um, and that seems like uh, silicates and organics were the likely mixture in this case as well. So going forward, um, there's gonna be a lot more progress that can be done with this type of analysis. So ALMA has been continuing to make great results in measuring outer debris disks, um, as well as scatter light measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm involved with um, one upcoming observation using HST coronography to measure the scatter light signature from Vega, which was actually the very first debris disk ever discovered, but uh, it hasn't been detected in scattered light since. Here's a graph, even from a couple of years ago, that highlights um, all the disks that have thermal emission and scattered light detections. So there's a number of, of data sets already in the archive that are suitable for this type of analysis. But looking ahead 
um, to new observations, JWST will also image uh, a lot of the nearby image, a uh, lot of the nearby disks and measure their scatter light color up to longer wavelengths and also can search for the water ice feature in scattered light at three microns as uh, discussed for the protoplanetary disk cases. Looking a little further ahead, the Roman Space Telescope uh, will image scattered light from even more um, distant disks. It has a very advanced high contrast imaging um, instrument with a very advanced coronagraph. It can also measure the polarization of the scattered light, which can also help us constrain the structure of the dust. Finally, um, gas phase observations of Debridis have revealed CO and atomic oxygen and carbon, which they interpret as um, volatile CO escaping from these planetesimals. And so we can combine our analysis of the solid properties and the solid composition with that from these gas observations to try to form a more complete picture of the composition of these leftover planetesimals. Uh, the far IR will also play a very important role for outer debris disks. Um, we can search for the water ice emission features, as I described again for protoplanetary disks. These have never been detected towards a debris disk to date. And again, SOFIA and the potential far IR probe um, will be key for this sort of endeavor. Um, modeling this feature, however, has revealed that it might be pretty tricky um, if um, photo, photo sputtering is included. And what's happening there is that uh, UV photons tend to um, knock the water and ice molecules off of the dust grains pretty rapidly. So it might be something where we, we try to find the water ice by looking at a range of different stars with different UV fields to, to see if we can measure this effect. If we could detect ice in um, stars with lower UV flux and not ice in stars with higher UV flux, that would be evidence that this is an important effect. Also in the far air, we can look at um, crystalline silicate features. So there's a, a feature detected around 69 microns. Um, it's been detected in only one or maybe two debris disks to date. This is again from the Beta Pictoris disk, and this was done with Herschel. But the power of this is that you can measure, you know, you can measure the crystalline um, fraction of of the uh, of the silicates of the cold silicates in these systems. You can also, based on the exact location um, of the feature, get constrain the um, iron to magnesium ratio in the silicates. And we can then compare that to what the types of crystallinity and iron to magnesium ratios we're seeing in the solar system. Moving to the inner parts of debridis systems, um, these are again the regions that are analogous to the zodiacal dust in the solar system. Here, the dust glows uh, in the mid infrared, and so we can take advantage of a number of mineralogical spectral features that we see in the, in the mid infrared. Um, there's really kind of two families of disks that have um, exozygical dust detected. In some of them, the, the emission is very bright and often variable. And this has been interpreted as um, evidence from massive collisions, like planetary embryos crashing together. In a lot of other systems, we see very low level dust, much fainter, and we see larger grain sizes, which suggests that this dust population might be more stable and more analogous to the sort of long-lived population of zodiacal dust in the solar system. Um, whenever you're dealing with faint signals in the mid-infrared, JWST is gonna be your hero. Uh, so going after some of these systems will give um, much better measurements of, its, of their mineralogy um, with improved sensitivity as well as spectral resolution versus the Spitzer data that I present here. And again, by examining these features in detail, it's another opportunity to um, compare with what we see from the infrared spectra of solar system materials. And finally, the Roman Space Telescope that I mentioned will have such an advanced um, high contrast and coronagraphic imaging system that it can actually detect these inner populations of zodiacal dust in scattered light for the most nearby debris systems. So if we can have great um, mid infrared spectral diagnostics, as well as scattered light diagnostics of these same dust populations, should give us very complete understanding of the exozodiacal dust in some systems. Lastly, I'm going to turn my attention to white dwarf disks. And again, these are systems which are post main sequence. The, the star has burned out and we're left with the remnant uh, white dwarf core. And um, in these cases, we see a dust disk, and that seems to be. Um, probably generated when planetesimals, which maybe have been disturbed from the outer parts of these systems, pass so close to the white dwarf 
but they're shredded by tidal forces. And so there's really three different phenomena detected in these white dwarfs that seem to all be related. First is the dust disks themselves, which are identified by their um, infrared excess. So this is the, 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 um, the warm dust blowing uh, in the infrared. Um, these systems are so small on the sky that they're almost impossible to image directly. So all we, we're really going on um, spectral diagnostics. Um, a number of these disks also see show um, atmospheric pollution. So in this case, uh, some of the material that probably arises in the disk falls onto the white dwarf directly. Um, and so we can see atomic uh, absorption lines. Um, I believe this is from uh, calcium in this source. And so that's direct um, element, gives us direct elemental abundances of some of this material. And finally, another subset of these systems also has gas disks. You can see gas emission lines. I think this is from calcium and magnesium around some of these disks. So um, we're trying to understand a lot more about these disks. One thing we're trying to, to tease out is their disk geometry. And so one project, um, which was led by an undergrad student that I mentored named Colette Levins, who is now a graduate student at Oxford, we looked at one of the brightest um, white dwarf disks named G2938. And it has fairly complete um, infrared spectral data, including uh, a prominent um, 10 micron silicate emission feature. And so we used radiative transfer models to try to understand um, you know, what we can learn about the disk geometry by fitting models to this infrared data. Um, so here are a number of the free parameters we included, the, um, the disk location, the scale height, the grain sizes, the dust mass, and how each of the, those parameters can change the model um, relative to what we see in the data. So our main conclusions from this project is that the, the dust seems to be located farther from the star than previously thought um, using more simple models, not these radiative transfer models. Um, also, the, the radial width of these dust rings seems to be fairly narrow. Um, and that is perhaps evidence for shepherding of this dust by a larger body. Um, similar to how we see narrow rings in some um, main sequence debris disks, which um, in some cases have been confirmed to be shepherded by planets, or how little moonlets um, shepherd the dust in the rings of Saturn. Um, we also find that the dust is the, the dust disk is more vertically extended than previous models have predicted. They're not flat like the rings of Saturn. And so the, uh, the evidence, you know, the explanation for that might be evidence for um, an ongoing, more or less continuous accretion of new planetesimal bodies being broken up, rather than this disk being the result of one singular previous um, disruption by a large asteroid. Um, and finally, we can, in other disks, so in G2938, the, the, um, the main feature was a, a large and smooth sort of amorphous silicate feature. But in some of these other disks, we see a lot more interesting mineralogical features. So these are spectra from Spitzer. Um, uh, Spitzer really only measured infrared spectra of a small number of disks. So this is a, a project I'm working on. It's a, a NASA funded study to analyze the mineralogy of these systems. You can see a lot of diversity here. Um, we think we see features from Enstatite and, and Forsterite, um, but some of these other features sort of in the six to eight micron range, we're still not sure what they are and we're working to identify them. So this might be another opportunity to really partner with some of our uh, friends in the astromaterials and cosmochemical chem chemical fields to understand, you know, what sort of solar system analogous material we might be seeing. Um, and then again, after we after we constrain the mineralogy, we can try to connect um, what we see in the mineralogy to the elemental abundances seen in the white dwarf pollution. Try to make a, a connection between the the solid state grains and their elemental composition. Going forward. Um, again, very faint signals uh, in the mid-infrared, um, we want to turn to JWST. So this will be really uh, a right field for getting much more sensitive and higher spectral resolution measurements of these mineralogical features. And thus understanding, you know, the composition of some of these planetesimal bodies that have been disrupted around other stars. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, conclude by saying that um, upcoming observations of protoplanetary disks, debris disks, and white dwarf disks with cutting edge observational facilities across the electromagnetic spectrum 
um, are going to offer very uh, new views into planet forming dust and ice. And coupled with sophisticated modeling and connection with solar system materials, I think we can make great progress in understanding whether um, potentially habitable planetary systems are common or rare in our galaxy. And with that, I'll be happy to um, answer any of your questions. Wow, uh, great uh, talk, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, it kind of reminds me of the riddle of the Sphinx with what walks at two, about two, four legs in the morning all the way to three legs at night by looking at disks from the formation of stars all the way till after, after their death. So great job on giving us that overview. Do we have questions for Nick? Um, I have a, a quick question, Jeff. Um, Nick, in the, the proplids that we see here on the upper left, um, has ALMA imaged anything that looks like it's being photo evaporated by the trapezium like that one? Is there any gaps in those disks or they, do you think they all are, are fated to be evaporated away? Right now, there, we, we don't have the, um, the spectral resolution or the spatial resolution to zoom in on this little blob and see if there's a tiny hole in the middle. Um, so yeah, with, with ALMA, you know, the, trip, the, the ONC is about three times farther away than those nearby star forming regions. So that's already a three times loss in um, spatial resolution. And these disks are already small. So if there is an inner gap or rings, they're on a smaller, probably on a smaller scale than I showed for that D-sharp sample. That being said, um, one thing I'd really like to do is target disks in the, in the ONC, especially the proplids with James Webb. There's been a, there's a real dearth of mid-infrared data um, in the ONC, partly because, well, mostly because Spitzer was totally saturated in that region. The, the whole region is so bright in the infrared that Spitzer couldn't observe it. So if we can take infrared spectra of this disk, we can maybe infer whether there's an inner gap there, based on its SED. Yeah. Is there a possibility to see isotopologs of CO there? Uh, potentially. So, um, you know, Every time you look at something with ALMA, you can set up the correlator to, you know, have a certain spectral, um, spect certain spectral channels. My analysis so far is just averaged them all together um, and looked at the continuum to probe the free free in the dust. But there is um, there is spectral information there, and that's something that needs to be looked at in the future. Um, the ALMA band seven survey that I mentioned did see some um, gas detections in that band. Uh, and especially some ionization traces. I believe that they saw some HCO plus. So, you know, we'll have to look at what lines exactly fall in the band three data and see what we can pull out. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Mike, I see your hands up. Yeah, uh, Nick, could you go back and talk a little bit more about your uh, disk dust model? I understand uh, the concept there that you use the uh, clustering algorithm to group zones in the disk of, of like chemical composition and density uh, to simplify <clears throat> the complicated radiative transfer. Uh, but what I didn't quite uh, get from that was like, what was the physics you assumed uh, to get to the point of those chemical compositions and densities and temperature in the disk? So what were your assumptions in uh, and and flow chain of, of creating that disk before you did the clustering and did the radiative transfer. Excellent question. Yeah, I didn't I didn't go on to the detail of that, and partly it's because this is a a disk chemical tool that has been used by a number of other people in my field, uh, and so I didn't want to repeat um, a lot of information that's already out there. But um, those other those other folks have used this tool primarily to to make connections with molecular species in the gas phase to interpret ALMA observations, for instance. So this is sort of an, an my approach was new in that I was really focusing on the ices. But the tool itself um, has a number of steps. So first we have to set up a, a, a dust disk model. Like what's the distribution of dust? What's the distribution of um, molecular hydrogen? And then we have to run an initial radiative transfer simulation of um, to, to calculate the temperature distribution for, throughout the disk. Because in order to run chemistry, you need to know the temperature everywhere. We also had to prop, do a separate radiative transfer run to propagate the ultraviolet through the disk, including a separate run for Lyman alpha photons 
which are scattered by resonance scattering um, in a slightly different way than other um, uh, UV photons are. So we need the UV flux, the UV field throughout the disk. And we also need to calculate the cosmic ray flux throughout the disk as UV and cosmic ray are some of the um, drivers of um, chemistry um, because they stimulate ionization. So then we, once we know that, we populate the disk with some initial um, mixture of different constituents. So we put in, um, in, in one case, we put in a bunch of molecules like you know, CO and water and some, and some basic things as we've detected in protocellular envelopes. In another case, we, we put in just um, bare, you know, loose atoms essentially as if the molecules have been broken apart. So whichever way you start, you have a, a set of initial um, chemical abundances at every location in the disk. And then you also have a long list of um, chemical reactions and each of them has, a, has an, uh, a rate coefficient associated with it that depends on things like the density and the, the temperature and the, you know, the, the radiation field, et cetera. And so it basically then, at each location, the disk steps forward with time, evaluating all of those reaction rates and then updating the abundance of each species in the model over time. And then that just cycles through every location in the disk. So that's what gives us the, the overall abundance as a function of time for all these different species. What's primarily driving the heating of the disk? Is it the external radiation uh, coming from the star, or is there so the something way else I, that's dominating? Yeah, good question. So the, the the way I set up this model was sort of a fiducial T Tauri disk in a low mass star forming region without a strong external radiation field. So the heating of the disk is caused is definitely from uh, radiation from the central star. Yep. See, Lee has a question. Yeah, so it's keeping on the this this model, just to so understand it. Um, since you're calculating rates, it's not thermodynamics only. It's um, you need to know barriers uh, for each of those reaction processes, um, and uh, so the. Literature is sufficient to do that. Um, for a lot, a lot of these are, are um, a little off the beaten track. If, if you um, look at you know uh, bare atom species uh, that are uh, or you know, um, they're not close to the standard states, put it that way. Yeah. So a lot of the the reaction rates are based on you know a whole a whole history of laboratory work. Um, tries to measure these reaction rates. So a lot of this goes back to some of the work of Eric Herbst and some other um, laboratory people, some theoretical astrochemists. So yeah, this is a regime, you know, um, where a lot of the chemistry is, is not like we would expect to see in a standard Earth environment. Um, there's really no three-body reactions. Um, the, there's very, the neutral neutral reactions have too high a barrier. So a lot of it's driven by ionization. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of these reaction rates are, are informed by either theoretical calculations or laboratory calculations. I think what we have in the model is fairly, you know, fairly accurate. I think there's definitely error bars on certain things, like, for instance, the binding energy of different species might have some error bars. Um, and that, you know, um, affects the rate of, for instance, sublimation and freeze out onto grains. Um, so all the reaction rates do have some error bars. I think, you know, we're also, you know, despite having... 600 some species and 7,000 or so reactions, you know, I think that we're fairly complete for some of the more simple species in terms of understanding their formation and destruction pathways. But as you get to more complicated species, we're definitely incomplete. Thank you. All right, I have a quick question for you, Nick. Um, the curves that you were showing for uh, reflectance for the disc, whether it was, you know, edge on or at, at 90 degrees. Uh, yeah, that was, so there's a huge difference, um, uh, just in the shape of the curve at around, oh, probably eight microns or so when you go from 90 degrees up to, to 75 degrees, do you know what's controlling that, that shape as you change the incidence angle? Yeah, I think mostly what's what's setting the shape of the continuum is just about 
you know, what parts of the disc are able to, you know, what radiation from what parts of the disc are able to escape more directly. The reason that this gets changes shape and goes fainter is that as you get more and more edge on more of that infrared continuum that's coming from the inner parts of the disc is being shadowed by the cold outer parts of the disc, right? And so um, it's it's more just about, you know, it's kind of obstructing this part of the disc more and more with the outer parts of the disc and relying more and more on scattered light to get up into the disc and out. And the scattering process, you know, depends very sensitively on the geometry of the disc surface and the properties of the dust grains there in terms of how they scatter. So it's a complicated um, sort of radiative, trans radiative transfer situation where you're obscuring more things and changing the amount of scattering that's required to get your continuum flux out. So I guess, you know, what material do you think is doing the scattering at those higher uh, incident angles? Um, yeah, so this is probably, um, you know, just probably bare dust grains, I'm guessing. And, you know, if you're, if you kind of believe this picture, um, you're scattering very near, you know, a lot of the scattering is coming very near the disk surface. And so that's probably, you know, um, at least in our model, it's probably not an area of very, very high ices. Um, but, you know, it could be some icy grains there, depending on the species. Um, there's, you know, some degree of scattering probably throughout again, depending on exactly the optical depth of different locations and the function of wavelengths and things like that. So it looks more like uh, amorphous silicates? Yeah, so the dust, so I should mention that, you know, into the radiative transfer, I, I showed this, uh, this thing where I mixed in, okay, what are we putting into the radiative transfer model? Well, I'm extracting the ice abundance of um, these, these six different species, but then you know, refractory dust has a it plays a major role in the in the um, rate of transfer as well, and we need to mix that in. So we already know where the dust is because we set it up that way. But in each cell, we have to figure out you know what's the ratio of dust to these ices. And the dust composition I used was a mixture of um, um, silicates and amorphous carbon. And does this type of modeling with with dust and ice set? help for like our solar system place where the snow line was and how it may have evolved through the formation process of our solar system. Yeah. So it's a little hard to see in these plots because I, I plotted on a linear scale rather than a logarithmic scale, but you can see where the the ice abundance, you know, of water ice, for instance, drops off in the in the inner parts. Um, the evolution of the snow line in the solar system probably, you know, how it moved in and out is probably not entirely captured in this model because we don't include things like accretion heating, right? So as, as the accretion rate in the disk, especially in the inner mid plane, that, can, that itself can heat the disk sort of from the inside out. And that's an important, um, import, plays an important role in setting where the snow line is in the inner part of the disk. Also the, you know, the, the luminosity of the star changes um, going from you know, an, an, a hot protostar, the luminosity decreases, and then of course over time uh, in the main sequence phase, the, the, the star um, brightness increases again. And we're not, we're not accounting for that at all too. We're leaving, a, we're leaving the star alone. Um, we're not modeling the accretion heating. And so uh, we don't really see the, the snow line evolve thermally. The thermal, um, the thermal properties of these, um, ice distributions are set very quickly. Um, and then it's sort of the chemical evolution that goes on um, more slowly over, you know, millions of years. Okay, thanks. Shankar, I see you have your head up. Yeah, I wonder if I could ask a kind of a naive general question that was inspired <laughs> by a lot of this. Um, so, and maybe it's best to ask in the context of a white dwarf. Um, you, you had a sort of series of plots where you tried different parameters um, so the night, yeah. So the naive general question is, so how, how do I understand how related these parameters are to each other when you do this fitting? So, um, like, is it that you could pick off each of the individual parameters from each of these plots and then that's your sort of best fit or are they related? Like if you were to plot like the Fisher information matrix for these different parameters, would there be shape in that or yeah, yeah. generally curious about? There are, 
definitely. There are degeneracies in the fitting, essentially. Um, so this plot is just showing the best fit that we got. And then, all right, hold all the other parameters the same and vary them one at a time, just to pull up the salient effect of each of these parameters yeah, for sure. demonstration purposes. We do, you know, plot the chi-squared, you know, for a grid of models, how it looks uh, for every parameter versus every other parameter. And there are definitely correlations. For instance, the, the minimum grain size in our dust population model is correlated with the inner edge of the, um, the dust disk because um, smaller grains can be, uh, will be heated to a higher temperature in the same radiation field. So if you have smaller grains, you have to push the disk out to cool it down to get the same infrared signature. Mm -hmm. Where you have larger grains, you want to push the disk inward. And you can see that sort of correlation you know, along the diagonal in those corner plots. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right. Any other questions for Nick today? I see Mike's got a second question. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, well, one of the things that you, you mentioned uh, was Sophia, but as you know, the 2020 decadal report uh, strongly recommended that Sophia be uh, terminated. So how does that affect um, your program? Yeah, um, well, uh, if it's flying, I will use it. Um, I. I'm not in a position to make that decision one way or the other. The decadal report did recommend that uh, Sophia be uh, shut down. Uh, I think that's going to be up to NASA itself. You know, the decadal report is run by the um, National Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's a recommendation. So, you know, I think NASA does its own internal reviews of all these missions on a regular uh, timeline, and we'll see how, um, how they weight that recommendation in their decision-making process. But well, yeah, they, I think they've, uh, they've already pulled it out of the next senior review. So they've announced that that okay. Sophia will not be be submitted as part of the senior review, and that's part of their response to the decadal. So I think kind of the writing is on the wall. Yeah, um, I try not to be too pessimistic. Um, this is part of the reason that I take a multi-instrument um, data and modeling approach to to what I think about. Some, some contingency planning. Um, I think, you know, Sophia operates across the, the infrared range. I think um, some of the wavelengths will be in, that Sophia was doing will be covered by James Webb, slightly different instrumentation, but I do think it's gonna be a sort of sad state of affairs for the far infrared where Sophia was the only game in town and the, um, the potentially proposed, they call it a step two instrumentation that was a much more sensitive far IR spectrometer, which was sort of what I was excited about for the reason they talked about. Um, if we don't get that, then that, that will limit what we can do um, for some of this far IR science until and unless we get um, the NASA um, far IR probe mission, which was you know, far IR probe mission, which was recommended by the decadal. Um, although, of course, that's not a sure thing either. So um, we'll see. Is there anything holding NASA to keeping Sophia? Because DLR is involved, but I don't know at what level DLR is involved in Sophia. Yeah, I don't know all the politics uh, of Sophia. I do know that US German science relations uh, have been part of the calculus, but I don't know how much that actually plays into it. Luckily, there are other games in town. Yeah, so actually, um, there is a there's a one of these far IR um, probe missions. It's actually having a, a workshop today, which obviously I wasn't able to attend. Uh, it's called the Prima mission, but I know there's like at least three or four of these, you know, starting to be concept designs um, that are, are being put together in response to that um, decadal recommendation. And then there's um, balloon stuff too, which can also be a an opportunity to go for the far IR. And we like Sophia for our moon water. All right, any last questions for Nick? I wanna thank you again, Nick, for that great talk. Um, and we will be in touch. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for having me.